Amen. Good morning and welcome to the Sunday service of the Church of God. We thank God for the new year, for His love and His grace that has given us a new life and a new hope in Him. And we thank God that we will have our first service of the new year. The title of our study today is The Origin of the Philippian Church. We will draw our scriptures from Philippians chapter 1, verses 1 to 3, and verse 6. Acts chapter 16, verses 9 to 15, verses 25 to 32, and verse 40. Almighty Father, we thank you for your everlasting love, your amazing grace. Amen. Thank you so much, Father, for the life that you've given us, the place, the time, and the opportunity to worship you in spirit and in truth, to be able to study your word, to learn from your children in the past, to be taught by your Holy Spirit. Father, we humbly ask for your presence in our midst, that you may bless us today. Bless everyone listening. You may help your speaker to preach and teach your truth with all love and boldness. Father, we know we have victory in you, and we thank you for all the blessings. This we humbly ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We begin a new study from the book of Philippians. And so today we will be studying the origin of the Philippian church. When the Apostle Paul was saved on the road to Damascus, the Lord had a job for him. That he was going to be preaching to the Gentiles. But before he could do that, he needed power from above. He needed to have the blessing. And we can find, you can find that verse in Acts chapter 13, verse 2, where the Holy Spirit needed to consecrate Paul and Barnabas. To consecrate is to separate one. For a special use. And so to be consecrated to God is to separate oneself from the world, from all the material things, and dedicate their life to God alone. And we see that after Paul and Barnabas was consecrated, how God blessed them in their ministry. that they went to Asia Minor and built many churches in the name of God. And to name a few of the well-known churches there, the Church of Galatia, the Church at Ephesus, how God blessed them. And the Apostle Paul, went to return and visit these congregations. Just how a good under-shepherd must do. To take care of his flock, to make sure that they are strong in our Lord Jesus Christ. And upon his return, he desired to visit other places in Asia Minor. But the Spirit of God had other plans. God did not will for Paul to do that. And we will see later on in our study why. But we see how the Apostle Paul listened to the will of God. Listened to his direction. That although the Apostle Paul had good intentions to go into new areas to preach the gospel, to spread the word of God. 
but God had other plans. We may know what is good, but God knows what is best. And so it is best for us to listen to the will of God. It is best for us to obey Him. For it will be not only for our own good, but for the good of His kingdom. Amen. We will begin with Philippians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Paul and Timothy, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus which are at Philippi, with the bishops and deacons, grace be unto you, and peace from God our Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. We always read these greetings from the Apostle Paul at the beginning of his letters how he greets them with love and tenderness, brotherly love from one child of God to another. That he always greets them in the name of our God and His Son, Jesus Christ. That there is always with grace and peace. It is said, that there is no peace without grace, no grace without peace. And there is no grace and peace without our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. These grace and peace come from our Father in Heaven. But without Jesus Christ, it would not have reached us. Amen. So it is by these attributes that the children of God depend, rely on our Father for. And we continually ask God for His grace and His peace to sustain us in our service to Him. And we always encourage our brethren, just as the Apostle Paul is encouraging the Church of Philippi, We pray for the brethren. We strengthen, encourage our brethren. We are the family of God. We are one. We are united. With one God, one love. And it is the will of God that His children be one in Him. It says He is one in the Father. Let us move on to verse 3 and 6. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, being confident of this very thing, that he which begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. That it may be whenever the church of Philippi supported the Apostle, or whenever he, he thought of them, he thanked God for his remembrance of his brethren at Philippi. Do we not do the same as well? How we thank God for our brethren. That at our every remembrance of them, we have brothers, we have sisters who pray for us, who love us, who have their genuine care and love for us. Amen. And we thank God every day for them. Amen. For we support each other. We support our services, support our efforts by prayer, by encouragement, by the grace and the love of God. We are strengthened by our brethren.
that we always have our brethren in mind, in our thoughts, in our prayers, for they always have us in their prayers. Amen. That there is always something to pray for, for our brethren, for the church of God, for the congregations of God. For the bride of Christ needs his strength. First and foremost, for their spiritual endeavors, the growth, the progress of his church. And second, they always need prayers for physical strength, physical healing, and help in this material world. And our God is so righteous that He hears the prayers of the righteous. And we thank God that He answers, He answers our prayers. We know He answers our prayers for we know how He supplies our needs. How He heals our brethren. How our services are blessed by Him. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Verse 6, Being confident of this very thing, that He which begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. The good work that was begun in the work at Philippi was the work of salvation. But the grace of God, the Word of God, His Gospel reached these people, reached the Gentiles by the Apostle Paul, by the leading of the Holy Ghost. That the Apostle Paul was strengthening his church, his brethren. That they that have the grace, the saving grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, to remind them not only that He is confident in them, but be confident in themselves. For the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ keeps us above sin. Amen. It, help, it helps us live righteously. It helps us to obey and to love God according to His will. It helps us to serve Him in spirit and in truth. And this good work, we notice that the Apostle says that it was begun in them. It begun in them, for it is a continual work. It is not a one-time work where the work is finished, but it is a work that is continually progressing, continually growing. That the salvation from Jesus Christ is something to be nurtured. To grow it, to feed it, with the Word of God, with the grace of God. And they are to perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. To perform is to use something, to put it to work. So once again, that is what we have always studied, that those that are saved are saved to serve. So we are to continually use the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are not to have His grace in vain. But we are to continue our service to Him every second, every minute, every hour, every day of our life. As the Apostle says, until the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is, we are to serve Him faithfully, righteously, either until the day that we die or until we are fortunate enough 
to be alive when our Lord Jesus Christ returns. That is staying faithful until death. Amen. Amen. Acts chapter 16, verses 9 and 10. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia. Assuredly, endeavored to go into Macedonia, sorry, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. So here we have the will of God revealed to the Apostle Paul. Definitely the main reason why the Holy Spirit prohibited them from going to new areas of Asia Minor. I was thinking that the Holy Spirit prohibited them because the Word of God has already settled in that land. That there were many churches settled and gathering in Asia Minor. And so the Holy Spirit wanted to spread the gospel to other areas of the world. And so it began the march of the Word of God westward into Europe into Macedonia. That God shows His will in different ways to His children. For we know how God works in mysterious ways. He sends them messages, sometimes explicitly, just as He did with the Apostle Paul here, but sometimes implicitly. Now we don't know how the Apostle Paul received this vision, whether in a dream or whether he was awake. But he knew right away that it was of God, directing him of what he must do next. And it was a cry for help. The man in Macedonia. The apostle knew it was someone from Macedonia, possibly from the way he talked, or just by the knowledge of the Holy Spirit. But that he, that person was asking for help, was not a physical help, was not a help from danger, but he knew it was a help for their souls. Yeah. And that is the state of the world today. That millions of souls need help. They need the Word of God. They need the Gospel of Christ. And it takes the children of God to get His direction, to preach the Gospel to every creature. To help them, to bring the truth to them. So it is up to the children of God not only to know His will, but to obey His will. And we see how the Apostle Paul obeyed that vision. In verse 10 it says, After he had seen the vision, Immediately, they endeavored to go into Macedonia. They wasted no time in obeying the Word of God, Amen. In, in obeying the direction. They didn't sit around waiting or loitering. They immediately got up and left. Isn't that a good example for us today? That 
that when the will of God is made known to us, how quickly we must move to carry out His word, to obey what He wants us to do. For this is not just anyone or anything ordering us to do something. This is our Father in Heaven who gave us life, who gave us our salvation. That we who have received that saving grace have given our lives for the gospel. That is why we are called the servants of Jesus Christ. We are indebted to Him. We live to do His will. We live to please Him. Amen. And there's no better way to please God than to obey His word, to do His will. To proclaim him to this world. Amen. Amen. Verses 13 and 14. And on the Sabbath we went out of the city by a riverside, where prayer was was wont to be made, and we sat down and speak and spoke unto the woman which resorted together. And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple, the city of Theatra, which worshiped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. So the Apostle Paul and his company reached Macedonia. And one of the first places they went to was to, the, to a riverside where people gathered to pray. And it is said that it was on a Sabbath. And it is said in the commentaries that I read that the people that gathered to pray on this riverside were new converts of the Jewish religion. Mm -hmm. They were proselytes. So these people that gathered did not have the truth with them, did not have the true religion. But that is not a reason to not preach the gospel to them. But that is exactly why the gospel must be preached to those that do not worship God in spirit and in truth. For we see that although they were in false religion, there is a woman here named Lydia that was sincere and honest in her service to God. Mm -hmm. That even though they, she did not have the truth, even though she believed in a different thing, she had love and sincerity in her heart to serve God. And God saw that. Mm -hmm. And that is why Christians, the children of God, do not judge unrighteously. The souls that do not know the truth. For we cannot see their souls. Only God can see their souls. Our only duty is to preach the gospel to them. Just as the Apostle Paul and his company did to these women. And when she heard the truth, how the Holy Spirit worked on her heart. For it is said that her heart was opened, that the light was shown to her life, 
and that she realized the truth that God has shown her. She attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. So she listened attentively. She was present. And thank God that her sincerity to that false religion translated into sincerity to the true and the living God. Verse 15, And when she was baptized, and her household, she besought us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. The one thing that we can take away from this verse are two things. Not one thing, but two things. Second, first thing was that she was baptized. That after receiving the saving grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, it is a necessity to be baptized. That we have spoken of baptism before. That it is an outward show for an inward work. That it is to show the world that your old self has now died to sins. And that once you are brought out from the water, you are now alive unto Jesus Christ. That this is necessary for all new converts in our Lord Jesus Christ. But the second thing from this verse that is important is how the Word of God reached her household Amen. because of Lydia. Mm -hmm. That is the beauty of the Word of God. That it truly changes people. It gives them a new heart. It shows them a new life, a new world of serving Jesus Christ. And we see how she did not keep it to herself. Just as the woman at the well in Samaria that met Jesus Christ, they were so excited to share the word. First to their loved ones, to their family. And this is how the word of God works in souls. That when they are introduced to the word of God, the family can see the new change in them. How they have been truly saved from their sins. And in that, they will be intrigued. That this is no regular religion. Or this is no New Year's resolution for a change of life. But this is the work of God. That there is power to change a person. Amen. And for the glory of God, not just one soul was saved on that day, but Lydia and her household was saved. What glory to our Father in Heaven when a soul was saved. For we know that all the angels are celebrating when only one soul is saved. So how much more when a whole household Amen. is saved. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Verses 25 and 26. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, 
and everyone's bands were loosened. So we jump from one scene to another here. Paul and Silas are thrown in prison. That if you read on the verses prior to 25 and 26, it was because there was a woman that were following Paul and Silas. And to my understanding, it was almost every day that she was following them. Proclaiming, these are the children of God. And she kept repeating it over and over. And the Apostle Paul, who got tired of it, for he knew that this woman was called a soothsayer, a fortune teller. Mm -hmm. It was said that she had divination. So she was able to tell things of the future. But she was only able to do this, for there was an evil spirit in her. Mm -hmm. And the Apostle Paul knew this, and he said to the woman, Come out of her and be gone. And she was freed from that evil spirit. Yeah. And also, her ability to foretell the future was gone. But there were evil men who were profiting off this woman. And once her abilities were gone, they were angry at the Apostle Paul and Silas. So they had them thrown the Apostle, thrown the two of them into prison. They had them beaten and imprisoned. And so that is why we are now in this scene of the Apostle Paul and Silas praying and singing to God. That even in the midst of trials and hardships, we have an example of our brethren here singing praises unto God. Giving thanks and praying to Him even in their time of trouble. I know it is easy to forget to be thankful to pray when we are in the midst of troubles for it, consume, it consumes us on how we are to fix a problem that we are in and we are focused on the storm that is ahead of us but we are reminded to look unto Jesus to not look at the storm, but to look unto Him, to trust in Him. Amen. And we are told to always be thankful, no matter what. So in troubles, or in times of happiness, we are to be thankful. For these trials, work to increase our faith. These trials work to help us grow in our love and trust in God. So we are to be thankful for it is only the children of God that encounter these problems. For God wishes, God wants us to grow, to be strong in Him. To continually pray in times of trouble, in times of happiness, and to sing, to sing praises to God. Okay. When we sing, we are not we are not sorrowful when we sing, but when we sing praises to God, we. It gives us joy to praise His name. And so, my brethren, do not forget to praise God in all seasons of life. Amen. For in doing so, 
we may encourage others. And we see how the other prisoners heard them and their praises. And then that earthquake came and they were all set free. For the Lord God is faithful to His children that He heard their praises. But we can also compare this to what I have always said, that sin is a prison house, that these prisoners who were in there with Paul and Silas were in the prison of sin. But because the two children of God were in there with them, that earthquake was the Word of God setting them free from their sins. That is the power of the Word of God. Mm. For we know how powerful an earthquake can be. Mm. But the power of God is more than that. For it is the power of God that can set one soul free from their sins. Mm. That no matter what is keeping you down, What is imprisoning you? The sin, the devil. The Word of God can set you free. The truth can set you free. Amen. Amen. Verse 27 and verse 28. And the keeper of the prison, awakening out of his sleep, and seeing the prisoner, the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried out with a loud voice, saying, Do yourself no harm, for we are all here. So we so this scene was at night time. I think it was at midnight. So everyone was sleeping. Even the prison guard. And we see how, thinking that everyone has escaped after the earthquake, the man was ready to take his own life. For back then, the punishment he would have received was that of the prisoners. That if he let them escape, he would have received the same punishment. So instead of receiving brutal punishment in the hands of others, Instead, he would have just taken his own life. But that is also an example of the state of the world today. First, we see how the prison guard was sleeping. The state of this world is asleep spiritually. They are asleep spiritually for they do not know God. They do not have salvation. Their eyes are not open to the salvation of God, to His truth. And so in His worldly sorrow, He desired to take His own life. The Bible says how worldly sorrow leads to death, but godly sorrow leads to repentance unto life. Amen. And we know many people are in deep depression, are in deep sorrow today. That they think that death will bring them peace. The death that they will escape their problems with killing themselves. But this is a lie that the devil is deceiving them with. Dearly beloved, do not take your life. For it is worse for you to take your life without knowing God and to listen to the devil in his lies. It is better for you to live 
to know God, to forsake your sins, and to have new life here. And we see how the Apostle Paul, somehow knowing that that prison guard was going to kill himself, Cause him to stop by saying, do yourself no harm, for we are all here. That is the work of the children of God. For souls today, that if they are in sin, and they do not have Christ, they are killing themselves every day. They are harming themselves every day with sin. But it is the children of God who is warning them, telling them every day, do not harm yourself. Stop harming yourself. For there is a better way. The love of God, the grace of God is your way out. The children of God are the hope of this world. We are their strength. We are their encouragement. We know that the Word of God is the hope and the saving grace for the souls. But sometimes we forget that His Word is also an encouragement for their minds. For they can hear that peace, that love. And it calms their souls. It pulls them away from that ledge. And brings them back to safety. Amen. Verses 29 to 32. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came in trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved in your house. So here we see how the prison guard wanted salvation. Amen. What must I do to be saved? That was not from physical harm. For he knows that all the prisoners were still there. So it was not harm because he let them free. But it was because he was still in sin. But now that his eyes are finally opened unto his condition, he humbled himself, trembled and fell before Paul and Silas. And we see the respect that he gave them. He called them sirs. What must I do to be saved? The Word of God that works on a penitent soul convicts them Amen. of their sins, convinces them Amen. that their sins, their soul are against God at the moment, that by the Holy Spirit, They are being drawn to Jesus Christ. Their hearts are being opened to receive His grace. So 
So by hearing the word of God comes faith. By the children of God preaching it, the word reaches these souls. And the Holy Spirit working in their hearts is drawing them to God. But the final requirement for salvation is the will of the penitent soul to come to Christ. To ask for salvation, to repent of their sins. What must I do to be saved? Then and only then will that soul receive salvation. No one else can receive salvation for you. But it takes a conscious, a conscious effort to seek God, to seek His salvation. And that is the requirement for salvation. It is not good works. It is not believing on some other doctrine, the teaching of devils. It is not repenting on some other person. It is not worshipping idols. Salvation is not being prayed for when you die. But salvation is here and now in life, in belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. In one name alone that you can receive salvation. There is no other name given under the even under heaven, whereby which we must be saved. Amen. And we see how we are not covering the rest of the verses today, but if you read past verse 40 or past verse 32, you see that the household of the prison guard was also saved. So now we have two examples of how the Word of God reaches souls. Amen. That I think that these two families may have been the first members of the church at Philippi. But we see how fast the Word of God works. When they are preached by consecrated and sanctified ministers of God. Amen. So let us continually work on our faith. Work on our commitment that we may receive more power, more grace from our Father in Heaven. Amen. For us to be able to do the work that He requires of us. For it is only by the Lord that souls are saved. Yes, our preaching helps. The sharing of the Word of God helps. Mm. But it is by the Holy Spirit that they are saved. Right. It is not by us. The Philippian church... is said to be a poor congregation. But what love they had for the Apostle Paul. Mm -hmm. For they were grateful. They were indebted with gratitude for bringing the Gospel to them. And in about, around four times in the Bible, it is recorded that they supported the Apostle in his ministry. Mm -hmm. That they sent him offerings. And that is a good example for us today. That if a poor congregation can support the work of God, how much more 
those that are blessed by the Lord Himself. Blessed with material riches. Mm -hmm. Blessed with abundance. Can we not do more for them? For our brethren who are in need. So let us give. Let us be cheerful givers. Amen. In this introduction to our study, though it was not filled with doctrine, we did learn some blessed reminders. We are reminded to preach the gospel. For we don't know how many souls are in need of it. And we don't know how, how they will respond to it. But when they hear it, and the Spirit of God works in their hearts, they will come to repentance. So no matter where we are, we are to be ready to show the way of salvation. The Apostle Paul was in prison, and the jailer and his family were saved. If you remember the qualifications of a minister, we are to be instant, in season and out of season. But that is not just for ministers alone. That is for every single child of God. Amen. We are to be ready to preach the gospel, to share the truth, to show the way. We are also reminded to support the ministry. A little help goes a long way. God sees our efforts. And we are not doing this just to anyone. These are our brethren. They are doing the work of God. And they need all the help that they can get. And the last reminder <coughs> is that we are to praise God at all times. In times of trouble, in times of hardship, in times of uncertainty, we have a new, new year ahead of us. We don't know what it holds for us. Yeah. But we are to praise God every day of this new year. This new year and ahead to the years to come. To not forget to pray, to praise God, to thank Him for everything. Amen. For we can do nothing without Him. And to thank God that for everything that we face, our faith grows, our love, our trust in Him grows. So everything that comes to us has a purpose. And we know that God is always with us. The congregation the convention in the Philippines, I remember the theme. Great Great is the faithfulness of God. So let us be faithful to Him. Amen. Amen. Return that faithfulness back. Amen. Amen. May God bless us all.
Mm. Almighty Father, we thank you for your faithfulness, for your love and your care for your children. Father, we thank you for never leaving us nor forsaking us. For Father, by your love, you sent your only Son in this world for our salvation. Father, we thank you for your children that you have sent, that we may have received your truth, your gospel. Father, we thank you for the work of the ministry. For by it, Father, we receive salvation. Amen. And Father, we humbly ask that we continue to do the works that you require of us. To continue to preach the gospel to every creature. To be ready to share your gospel. And Father, to be always ready to help the ministry. To help your children. Help us, Father, to be cheerful givers. To be helpful to everyone. Father, we thank you for your good graces, for your love. Father, we ask that you bless your ministry on this earth for this new year. Amen. Help us be strong. Help us to continue the fight to preach your word. To help to praise you at all times. Amen. Father, we thank you so much. This we have we ask of you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. amen.